come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'm going to share a bit of a how to play as well as my review of Shake That City coming to Kickstarter November 29th from AEG. Should you be shaking in anticipation to back this Kickstarter project? Or should you shake the dust off your boots and mosey right on past this city? Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open today, I am going to be sharing a bit of a how to play as well as my review of Shake That City from AEG. It is coming to Kickstarter on November 29th. It is designed by Mads Clay and Kari Torndal Jair. I'm sure I butchered those names. I apologize. Artwork is provided by the easily pronounceable Olga Kim. Game is for one to four players, ages 10 and up, plays in about 20 to 40 minutes. That really depends on the number of players. And once again, as I mentioned, it is coming to Kickstarter. So let's swing on over to the other camera because here I've got Shake That City. So before we dive in, do you want to point out the fine folks over at AEG were kind enough to provide me with this review copy, but neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share this Kickstarter coverage with you. And these days, especially with Kickstarters, it's important that you know that. Okay, let's jump on in. So first off, rule book, about eight pages. And uh, one page is devoted to putting together the shaker. Got another page or two devoted to variants. So all in all, super easy to jump into and wrap your head around. And the rules presentation, I had absolutely no uh, misunderstandings at all. Understood how to play right away. So in this game, each of the players is taking on the role of a city planner, and they're going to receive a city board, which is where they're going to be laying out various different types of districts in the city. There are five types of districts. So this is the landlocked side. This is the side that recommended you actually learn to play the game on. We flip it over. We also have a beachfront side that uh, makes the game a little bit trickier, a little more puzzly, but not complex whatsoever. So each player is going to receive their city board. They're also going to receive bonus tiles, which they're going to flip them over so they can randomly place them around to the edges of their city board, like so. Although this diversity tile is always going to be here because it's the corner. And what these basically do is they give you a couple of options. It's either or for you to score bonus points at the end of the game. And I'll discuss that when we get to that point. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be laying out various different districts throughout your city. So we have roads, parks, factories, shopping and houses, and each of them score a little bit differently. And we're not talking about just the bonuses here. We're just talking about the tiles themselves. So as an example, roads score a point for each tile as long as it is connected to an edge. So as an example here, something like this at the end of the game would score you two points because this connects to this, which connects to the edge of the board. This would only score you one because that connects. This does not. You never connect diagonally. So at no point in time are you able to score based on adjacency by being diagonal 
do something. So that's how the roads score. Now, the parks, parks like to be next to factories. So if a park is next to any number of factories, that's worth a point. Parks also like to be next to houses. So if it's next to a house, it's worth a point. If somehow it's next to a factory and a house, that would be worth two points. So next we have factories. Factories like being next to parks. Not really. They like being next to factories. So if a factory tile is next to another factory, that's worth one. If it is next to a road, then it is also worth one. So something like this would actually make this worth two points. Keeping in mind that your roads, you're going to want to set them up so that they connect to an edge. That's kind of the same way that your shopping works. So shopping is worth different points based on where it's placed on your city board. So if it's at the city center, this is going to be worth three points. If it's out here, it's worth two points. And if it's out here, it's worth one point but it must be next to a road that connects to the edge of the board. So that is one of the tricks there. Then we have our houses. Houses like to be by themselves or next to other houses. So in a situation like this, that's worth two points. Something like this, both of these together are worth two points. And unfortunately, houses don't like being next to factories. So in a situation like this, this would be worth zero points because it's next to a factory. And this would be worth zero points because remember, these count together as two and this is next to a factory. So you want to try to keep your factories away from houses. And then, of course, with our bonuses, we have each of those different types of districts as well as a wild tile. So as if I have four factories in this row, I would get a bonus three victory points. Or if I have all the tiles filled in this row, I could get three victory points. It's either or. I can't get both on this tile. Same with the parks, roads, shopping, houses, as well as wild. This is basically any four types gets me the bonus here. And then with the diversity tile, it is any two of each of the districts will get you three bonus victory points. So that's how everything scores. That's how you want to lay things together. Do want to mention there are far, far more tiles than what I have out here. I just didn't want things to be too cluttered. As you can see, we got a lot of home tiles, houses tiles. We also have a board here that's not only going to show us our scoring, kind of examples of scoring, but it's also going to show you how many cubes are in this shaker. So you're never going to know exactly what's coming up because when you use the shaker and dispense the cubes, which I'm going to show you how you do that in a moment, when the turn is over, you're going to put those cubes back into the shaker. They're not removed from play. So it's not like you're counting cards, counting cubes in this case, because those cubes go back into the shaker. So each turn, there are 15 in the game. Each turn, you'll have an active player. And the active player is going to shake the shaker. They are going to push the tab. Usually it kind of helps if you shake it around to make sure that if there's something stuck, it pops out. And then you're going to reveal what cubes have come out. So as an example here, we have four roads. We've got two factories. We have a couple of shopping and we have one uh, with homes. 
So here's the interesting aspect. This is what makes the puzzly aspect of Shake That City really stand out. All the players have to make sure that all of their city boards are all orientated the same exact way. Because what you're going to do is you're going to actually select these colors. But when you're laying your tiles down, they must be in this same orientation. So as an example, let's say I'm the active player. I get to pick a color and then none of the other players can take that color. So that's what being the active player uh, makes things pretty tricky. And you can sort of screw over your opponents a little bit by doing that as well. Now, that's the first 12 rounds. The last three rounds, that does not uh, come into play. So the last three rounds, it's any color. Players can take any color. So as an example here, let's say I say I am going to take blue. So I have to make sure that I lay out my stores correctly. So this would be correct because it matches exactly what I see here. Now, I cannot do something like this because... That doesn't match up. You can't rotate this. It has to be just like that. So I would go like something like this because I understand that if I can make sure that this is next to a road that leads to an edge, that's three victory points. That's two victory points. Now, once I've laid my tiles, that's it. They're there to stay. So a bit of a Tiny Towns vibe, if you are familiar with Peter McPherson's game, which the gang and I love. We really enjoy that. That's a game that has to stay in my trunk. In my, no joke, in my car. Because every once in a while, uh, I'm over at my brother's house. And kids are like, hey, you got, uh, you got that Animal Town game? They never remember the name of it. So it does have a bit of a, a Tiny Towns vibe to it. It's not exactly the same it's it's different it's just like i said a vibe that i get where it's you're building a city you're placing tiles there's a bit of a puzzle aspect you're locked into where these are now located i can't move them i can't touch them uh once they've been laid down i can't build over them or anything like that something else i should point out too is that no matter if you're the active player or if you're, you know, uh, just selecting colors afterwards, you have to make sure that you can place every single tile. So as an example, this with the roads is a little tricky, right? So let's say I go like this, like that, and like this. So that would make, that would match here, right? So early on, that's easy. I mean, I, I have all the space in the world to put this. But as the game progressed, if I had something like this, and maybe I had these outer tiles available, but I didn't have these, then I can't do it. So if I couldn't fit any of the other tiles, either any of the cubes that are showing, I don't get to place anything. So it's not unusual to complete the 15 rounds of the game and not have every single spot filled in on your city. It's not unusual at all. And I will point out that that doesn't mean you're not going to win. So we have seen plenty of players that still had open space win a game simply because they rolled with the punches a lot easier or a lot better than the rest of the players, or they planned out a little bit better. So one thing that I, I do recommend when the game starts off is you don't necessarily want to jump on multiple cubes, right? Maybe two, three, something like this with the four. You're kind of locking yourself into an approach to the game that, you might end up 
not getting the right configuration later on because it all comes down to the configuration of these cubes. So even as the active players starting off, I might just say, I'll take the houses. And then all I got to do is once again, I have to use this as a grid. And I can put a house here, put a house there, put it over here, you know, any, anywhere kind of in this area because of the way the grid is set up. And that's going to still leave me a whole heck of a lot of options. So just pointing that out, that grabbing as many tiles as you possibly can is not always the best move when you're playing Shake That City. So after 15 turns, rounds, whatever you want to consider them, you're going to total up your points. So you're going to total up the points just from the way the board is laid out. And you will also look towards your bonus tiles up here as well. And of course, whoever has the most victory points is declared the best city planner. And that all in all really is how you play Shake That City. So let's swing on over to the other camera because I'm going to share some final thoughts, as well as a review score. So one of the first things I'll mention, those of you out there who follow thegaminggang.com or you watch the videos, you're probably wondering, geez, Jeff, you're doing a Kickstarter review? You don't really do Kickstarter reviews anymore. And that is true. I don't. I don't really do many Kickstarter videos at all. But I go way back with AEG, and I love a lot of AEG's games. So I am making an exception to provide some Kickstarter coverage for the upcoming Shake That City project. I'm also going to give this a review score, which I almost never do with a Kickstarter, and that's because the game I received is pretty much the finished product. There may be a couple of tweaks here and there, but the game I received is pretty much going to be the retail game. And that is important as far as any sort of review score I would give. Cause normally I'd, I'd just say, Hey, you know, I like it. What do I think about it? But I, I don't give it a review score this time. I will. I found shake that city to be a lot of fun. And I'm actually, well, Kickstarter hasn't started yet. But I was originally planning on getting this review out a little bit earlier. But then I decided I wanted to bring it on over to my brother's house for Thanksgiving for a, a bunch of the gang to play. And everybody enjoyed it. So we've had a good time with it. I like the puzzle aspect of the game. It is certainly a gateway game. You can easily introduce tabletop gaming to friends who haven't gotten into games before. Rules are super, super easy to wrap your head around. Got to be honest, I mean, it's not reinventing the wheel by any stretch of the imagination. Like I said, it, it does have a good kind of Tiny Towns vibe to it. But all in all, we really have enjoyed the game. And the only thing that I will point out is when you're putting the shaker together, you got to be very careful with how you assemble it. In fact, in the rule book itself, it wasn't super clear. So once I assembled the shaker itself, sometimes eight cubes would come out of it. Sometimes 10 cubes would come out of it. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen every once in a while. So you may want to come up with some sort of like a house rule where it's like, well, okay, so if we get 10 cubes, this is what we do. Normally that cube is just on top of another cube, so you can just pick it up and toss it back into the shaker. Uh, I know there is a video now to show you how to correctly assemble the shaker, which I got to be honest, I, I haven't watched. Because with the rubber bands and, and things holding the shaker together, I essentially got it to work. So anyway, on a scale of zero to 10, I certainly do enjoy 
Shake That City. I'm going to give it a, a solid recommendation and score it an 8 out of 10. I think it is good. I think especially, you know, if you like AEG's current lineup of like family-oriented games, they're not super simple games or anything like that, but they are family-friendly, and most of them are gateway games. If you've been digging what's been coming out from AEG, you are certainly going to enjoy Shake That City. All right, that is it for this time out. If you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already, and if you do subscribe, ding that bell. It will not only let you know when I upload standalone videos such as this review, it will also tell you when my live stream, the Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Central, right here on YouTube. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you won't find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. All right, thank you so much taking some time out of your busy life to check out this review and here's hoping each and every one of you get to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, that's okay. You don't have to leave just yet. In fact, why don't you subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel right here or take a peek at the latest live stream or even find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks again for watching.